So before starting, I just wanted to say a couple of words. Um, I really cannot imagine uh, a lecture that is more touching for me than this one at so many levels. So the first one is, of course, because of Professor Lambert. I mean, he's been always an inspiration and it also has actually had a transformative impact on the field of vaccinology. So for that, it's quite of an honor to actually just present this lecture. But there's also some more personal reasons for me to be really touched by this lecture. I was a very young student uh, from Algeria working in his department at the WHO uh, group that he was leading uh, in Geneva. And this is very much in this department that I became, and I was really hooked to the idea of trying to understand immunity to parasitic disease in particular at the time and how the immune system fights against microbes, really very much uh, a defining moment in my young life as an investigator. And there is an additional layers of, of why this, this lecture is important to me. I was founded by the Mario Foundation when I was a PhD student. So honestly, I will not be here giving you this lecture without all these components. So that's for me is an extraordinary uh, pleasure to deliver this lecture for all these reasons. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about the role uh, of the microbiota in the immune system. And I'm gonna start with relatively general phenomenon and actually how our own work, but also the work of many people in the field have helped uh, explaining the fundamental alliance between the microbiota and the immune system. And along my lecture, I'm gonna actually highlight how this could relate, of course, to response uh, to vaccine in particular. So I am located in the National Institute of Health um, and uh, in one of the places that also contributed to the development of one of the vaccine that is to today, the Moderna vaccine, that is actually one of the one in the, uh, distributed worldwide. And if I didn't know infectious disease was important before, I have to say that this past year, as for all of us, has reminded us of the importance of the work that many people involved in this course are doing, which is actually to maintain vigilance and to maintain actually innovative approaches to combat the high diversity of microbes that can actually affect us. So I'm working in an institute that actually very much does that. My laboratory is uh, coming from all around the planet, which is actually one of the great uh, and wonderful aspect of science. Uh, many of you uh, that are following this course probably come from different places, but so am I, and so are many people that are coming from my lab. Um, and the question that we address uh, in the laboratory are very much in line with trying to understand how the immune system is actually wired. And it is actually clear that the immune system is not just a system of attack. It is, in fact, a system that constantly integrates environmental cues and allow the host to restore immune cells. And infection is one of these uh, triggers. The, the immune system is actually controlled by the microbiota, by nutrition, by the environment, including actually previous infection. And all of that together allow the immune system to actually function. And this actually, under physiological condition, this, this physiological alliance between the immune system and those external sensors is really what allows it to, the host to function. But of course, we all do know that we have pushed uh, our immune system to extreme, and we have exposed our immune system to an aberrant microbiota, and I'll discuss that later on, in which actually there is dramatic change, the quality of the microbes that live with us. The diet that we have is no longer physiological, and in some case, um, quite toxic. The environment and pollution in particular can affect our immune system. We are actually now taking drugs. And of course, the kind of infection that we encounter are distinct from the one we have actually co-evolved with. And for all these reasons, we are now in a state now of dysbiosis as an organism. And actually, this is believed to contribute to the etiology of numerous inflammatory diseases that we have um, uh, developing in, in, in many parts of the world. So my laboratory is tackling some of this question. This is, of course, a very, very broad topic. But we're trying to understand how the microbiota, previous infection encountered by the immune system and nutrition can actually control the immune system. And we're trying to understand how the immune system is actually wired in a very tissue-specific manner with a specific uh, focus on both the GI tract and the skin, which are primary sites of exposure to the microbiota. So one thing then, and I'm going to discuss with you essentially some of the work we do in the context uh, of, of the microbiota, but I have to say that we have a growing understanding in the laboratory and growing appreciation uh, of the role of nutrition in all of this phenomenon that has really taken center stage in our lab. But one thing that is important to remember is that we are a composite of microbial species, and I'm going to discuss further how complex this composition is. 
uh, we not only have, of course, a mammalian genome, but in vast majority of what we have in terms of genome, the one of our microbes that live with us. And this will be, of course, bacteria, the one that has been studied the most, but also fungi, viruses, and protozoans that are actually part of our microbiota. And all of these collectively represent an enormous force in the control of host immunostasis. And over the last few years, it's been really a transformation of our understanding of what we are and really reposition uh, our understanding of self as really a meta-organism, a composite of mammalian cells and microbial cells. And work that has been done by numerous people in the field has now pointed to the microbiota as really a central regulator of host physiology. The microbiota, of course, was previously well recognized for its role in nutrition and ability to generate vitamins or metabolize different factors. But more than that, the microbiota also control host metabolism. There is really um, impressive work that is actually highlighting the importance of the microbiota in changing behavior and the level of anxiety, stress uh, in the experimental system and actually more, more and more organized in human settings. Uh, the microbiota can have an effect locally in the sites in which the microbe are actually living, but also distally. And what I'm going to discuss with you today essentially is the role of the microbiota on the immune system. So, but before I wanted to, to move forward, I just wanted to highlight a couple of important points of the microbiota that are important to take in account, which is the fact that working on the microbiota is not a simple task because the microbiota is really defining each individual. There's enormous diversity of composition of microbiota and function of the microbiota based on genetic wiring, based on where you live, the diet you have, based on the kind of infection you had in the past and so forth, which means I'm really trying to understand the role of the microbiota in disease state or in vaccine responses is an enormously complex challenge because each of us really contain different microbiota. So um, over the last couple of years, um, Yvonne in the laboratory together with Rob Knight that has actually developed this extraordinary resource that allows to, to collect microbiota from a large number of individuals with a very comprehensive questionnaire, allow them to really redefine in a more thorough way what was really the critical component that allows to distinguish microbiota between individuals. And this actually is a framework that now allows us to make the right control when we actually assess the role of the microbiota in the context of human settings. So there is some variable that you really need to take into account when you separate individuals and try to understand. And this is a very important question because a lot of um, previously uh, published papers did not take into account the fact that when you have a disease state, lifestyle can actually change and consumption of different kinds of, of um, nutrients or alcohol, for example, can actually be an enormous variable in the microbiota composition. So that said, uh, the microbiota is now recognized uh, and that has been done essentially in experimental settings, but also as I will highlight in the context of clinical settings, has been shown to control virtually all aspects of host pathogen interaction. So transmission of certain viruses, and this has been true very much in the context of the GI tract, uh, is controlled by the microbiota. And in fact, the microbiota can promote transmission of viruses. I will discuss that further, but the microbiota is not driven in the sense that it promotes protective immunity to pathogens. The microbiota, when it's actually um, heightened in inflammatory responses or when there is aberrant immunity against them, can cause pathological responses. The microbiota and dysregulation of them can contribute to sequelae of infection. And as I will discuss later, the microbiota also plays a surprising role in tissue repair. One point that I just wanted to highlight and discuss briefly with you, just because the fundamental importance in the context of infectious disease is the importance of the microbiota in the phenomenon of colonization resistance. So we think about the microbiota for the most part as a healthy partner of the immune system. And this is for the most part true. However, each microbiota does contain, at steady state in all of us, a large number of microbes that can have the potentiality to cause disease. And these actually include antimicrobial resistant pathogens. So they're really very much in our GI tract at any given time, ready to potentially re-emerge. So one of the primary functions of the microbiota is really to exert pressure over uh, this microbe and prevent expansion of these pathogens. Um, and this is, of course, extremely important because antimicrobial anti, um, anti resistance is something that is actually taking an enormous space in the clinical um, uh, 
um, world. And there's really a dramatic emergence um, of microbes that have acquired antimicrobial resistance. So really trying to understand the importance of the microbiota and limiting this pathogen is an active line of research and something that was really beautifully done and pioneered by people like Eric Pimmer, for example. And this actually led to a really transformative, very simple uh, approach, which is that for patients that are treated with um, a broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, some of them can develop massive expansion of my almost Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, um, can develop um, an expansion of microbes that can have potentially uh, negative consequences. And this will be the case, for example, of Clostridium cd difficile. And this actually led to a transformative approach that is a macrobiota transplant, in which these patients can now be transplanted with the macrobiota of a healthy individual. And this extremely simple approach, this very simple ecological treatment, has actually allowed the cure of a C. difficile infection in the most people that have been treated. So this line of, of uh, work really now is taking an enormous amount of space and is actually utilized in numerous um, settings, including infectious, but also in the context of a response uh, to immune checkpoint therapy, and I'm going to discuss that later. Just to give you an example of the dramatic impact of antibiotic treatment on the emergence of pathogen, it's a very simple experiment that Apollo in the laboratory utilized to uncover novel mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance in the gut. And what he did, he utilized Klebsiella pneumoniae, that is actually a bacteria that can, of course, acquire some antimicrobial resistance, and did that in the mice that was treated with antibiotic or not. And as you can see, if the animal has antibiotics, no problem, it can actually control perfectly well the infection. If you treat the animal with antibiotics, uh, this uh, pathogen really is not clear from the host at all and could eventually kill the host. So just a simple antibiotic treatment now can allow the microbe to dominate and to cause a severe disease state. So in the context of the work of Apollo, what he was able to show is that surprisingly, uh, you can utilize a previous infection to discover a novel agent of antimicrobial resistance. He found that if an animal has been infected with a pathogen, the macrobiota acquire a form of memory. And this is actually due to a remodeling of the host that produce different kinds of balances. And the macrobiota from this animal previously infected produced more sulfide. And this sulfide now block um, infection uh, subsequently. So this is a very simple approach in which what we're doing in a laboratory now is to using how naturally the host adapts to an infection to develop novel mechanism of resistance to try to understand if we could utilize non-antibiotic treatment to combat um, these kind of pathogens. So trying to very much use this ecological approach that is observing how the host develops infection to identify novel molecules that allow better response to infection. But I'm going to go back to the point that I wanted to discuss with you the most today, which is related, of course, to the immune system. So I am not an immunologist by training, but actually immunology found me along the way. And uh, it happened very much to the angle of looking at host microbe interaction. And few years ago, we're very uh, lucky, Nicola Bouladou, Jason Holt, Jason was actually a graduate student in my lab at, at the time, to stumble into a very simple uh, observation that in fact turned out to be quite important. What Nicola and Jason were doing was to take animals and treat them with antibiotics. And what they were able to show is they infected an animal with a macrosporidia. The mice that were treated with antibiotic had a defect in mounting L17 um, in the gut or interferon gamma, both cytokine important for the control of the infection. And this was linked also with a heightened expression of this, of this um, um, pathogen in the GI tract. So this was, in fact, the first real demonstration that the macrobiota really could prevent expansion of this microbe via the action on the immune system, not just via the control of its antimicrobial resistance. Subsequently, work from Dan Littmann demonstrated using a microbe that is called SSB, that is highly represented in mice, that this microbe could actually enhance R17 in the GI tract, and just the presence of this microbe was sufficient to allow the host to control better Citrobacter infection. And this was the first demonstration that unique microbe can, in some cases, push the immune system uh, to control infection. So this has been um, then became really a framework for many studies, not by not only by us, but by many numerous people. And really, this adjuvant role of the microbiota in promoting immunity to the pathogen has been now shown in almost every single infectious model that has been tested. 
So more broadly, the work has really exploded and really it has been now shown that the macrobiota control the immune system and virtually all aspects of the immune system. So the macrobiota can, of course, as I mentioned before, promote immunity that in turn can control better infection. The macrobiota can, of course, um, and this is something that is of high importance to this uh, audience, control the quality and response to vaccine. I'm going to come back briefly to this point later. The macrobiota can influence the quality of immune checkpoint therapy responses. And that is actually truly remarkable. We're evol involved uh, recently uh, in the collaborative work with Jodo Tinkeri at the NIH that demonstrated that if a patient was refractory to immune checkpoint therapy, you can take the macrobiota of an individual that responded to the treatment and give them back to those refractory patients. And this was sufficient to now restore susceptibility to the treatment. So it's quite remarkable to think that just once again, taking the macrobiota and putting it back to someone could allow them now to respond to the treatment. So this has been now confirmed in several studies. And actually, as you can imagine, this line of research is now really attractive for the field in terms of enhancing our responsiveness to those life-changing treatments. But of course, because the microbiota constantly push the immune system, this can sometimes backfire. And uh, the microbiota has been linked to uh, allergic responses, amplification of autoimmune disorders, and inflammatory disorders. The one that is the most studied, of course, would be inflammatory bowel disease, but allergy also is actually quite studied because it has now been shown in human that treatment with antibiotics early in life correlate with heightened ability to develop allergic response on the long run. So really trying to understand how those microbes positively or negatively interact with the immune system is absolutely fundamental at all aspects uh, of host response, but also at different stage in development. So just one word that I need really to highlight in terms of what is understood about the role of the microbiota in vaccine. So uh, we, a few years ago, had actually shown that it very much in line with what we have shown with, uh, with macrosporidia, then an oral antibiotic treatment prevented the ability of the mice to develop response to oral vaccine. And this has been subsequently uh, confirmed in other settings in which people have done different kind of study, but really the most um, in telling study that came out recently it was the one from Bali Pulandrum, who took uh, healthy individuals and treated them with a blood, broad spectrum antibiotics and assessed the ability of this individual to respond uh, to a vaccine. And what he was able to show is that in a fraction of this uh, individual, and particularly those that have poor response to vaccine, the quality of the antibody, the glycosylation pattern of this antibody was highly controlled by the presence of the microbiota. So this is really an early stage development because of course much more remain to be understood, but this is quite, this is the first core principle in human then changing and altering the microbiota can actually change the quality of antibody responses. Something that of course has enormous consequences when we think about the number of people that are vaccinated currently. So, of course, um, the microbiota can control vaccine responses in numerous uh, aspects. The first one that is actually well documented is the fact that the microbiota just control the metabolism. So it's just the nature of the inflammatory cell that can go to the tissue in the context of vaccination will be controlled by the microbiota indirectly. It has actually been shown that the status of activation of monocytes, for example, is controlled by the microbiota and specific ligands produced by the microbiota. The macrobiota can, of course, also affect the tissue threshold of activation by locally activating the cells, thereby allowing immunity to actually just be um, developed. The macrobiota, of course, uh, can change in composition and diversity. Um, the macrobiota can, as I mentioned before, can act as an adjuvant. And the macrobiota has also been shown via the production of specific metabolite to enrich and enhance the ability of memory cells to survive. So if you think about it, really the macrobiota can be really this partner of every single step of a vaccine development and vaccine responses. But at the same time, this regulation of this microbe can, of course, interfere with specific aspect of this response. And one point that we need to remember that is actually, I think, extremely important when we think about immune responses and vaccine is that within the macrobiota, there are more antigens than it could be in any form of cell pathogen, food they have antigen, and so forth. So the potential for cross-reactivity between macrobiota-derived antigen and any antigen we utilize in the context of vaccination or antigen present in pathogen is enormous. And in fact, there is a lot of evidence 
that almost all antigen can find their mirror within the macrobiota composition. How much of this pre-pool of antigen specificity existing in individual can actually predispose to respond to subsequent vaccination has not been well studied yet, but I think it would be really an important line of investigation to really try to understand how potentially this would contribute to the quality of responses between individuals and maybe in some cases potentially interfere with the development of optimal immunity to certain vaccines. What I'm going to just finish with is actually some um, just um, very recent work in the laboratory that is bringing a new dimension, at least to us, about how we think about the microbiota. Um, and this actually relates uh, to a question we started to address a few years ago. So we had actually worked for quite a few years now on trying to understand how the microbiota communicate with the immune system and actually push the immune system. But we wanted to actually now kind of think a bit differently how the immune system sees this microbe. And the reason we became really puzzled by this question is because most of what we understand about the immune system came from the work that many of us have done in the context of pathogen. It also came from those fundamental principles that were actually developed by Pauli Matzinger or Charles Genoway that highlighted the importance of uh, adjuvant and inflammation in the induction of immune responses. It has actually been postulated that in absence of inflammation, there will be no immunity. And this, uh, this appeared to be mostly dominantly true. So it is actually well understood that in the context of a pathogen or a vaccine that is utilizing an adjuvant, you will have inflammation tissue damage. This alert the immune system that now actually developed, the cells can go back to the tissue where they can mediate protection, a class of immunity that of course can of course also lead to immunopathology. But there is really a paradox there because the macrobiota that is present in every tissue can induce T cells and B cell responses. No problem at all. You're going to have IG, IgG, you're going to have T cells, you have everything you want. But this happened with no inflammation. So this really is worse to us, actually, a paradox. I mean, how do you actually reconcile all what we understand about the immune system to this very strange phenomenon where, in absence of inflammation, the immune system develops immunity against uh, the macrobiota? So the first question we ask is, first, why do you develop this immunity against the microbiota if this is really has nothing to do with the control of the agent? So we first decided to try to understand the function of common source specific T cells in tissue. And for that, we spend a lot of time developing tools and reagents to track antigen specific responses. And the tissue we decided to utilize to address this question was no longer the GI tract, in which we spend a lot of time uh, working but was actually the skin. And the reason we decided to work on the skin was first, as it's always the case, because of a remarkable graduate student who joined my laboratory and actually was really uh, intrigued by this idea. Uh, and the second is because we had this really wonderful collaboration with Julie Segre at the NIH that had uncovered the diversity of the human uh, skin microbiome. And the third advantage of the skin is that it's a tissue that is extremely amendable to change in microbiota. It is highly permissive because basically just painting a new microbe at the surface of the skin allows uh, to just change the microbiota of the skin. So even if you have your own microbiota, if we paint the skin of someone, there would be really a long-term association with these microbes. And, and, and the additional uh, event that I think is really important, the microbiota live in very specific structures that have follicular sebaceous gland and in very low biomass. So we postulated then for all these reasons, we could potentially look at mechanism in a more easy way than we do in the GI tract that has this enormous dynamic ecosystem and nutrition. So this really allows us over the years to develop um, a collection of microbes that we collected initially from mice, but now from a broad range of patients, including melanoma patients or patients that suffer from various inflammatory disorders. Uh, this microbe are uh, applied at the surface of the skin of an animal that has its own microbiota. This is actually done in a very gentle way. The animal, there is no shaving. You basically literally take a little brush and paint it at the surface of the skin. This is sufficient to actually communicate with the immune system. And we have found over the years that very surprisingly, although less surprisingly today, because it's been very beautifully shown in numerous other tissues, defined microbe can impose a very unique signature on the host. So for example, we found microbe that can only activate gamma delta T cells in the skin. Then we have other microbe that only activate mid cells. And then we have other microbe that activate everything. So this really gave us this really 
fantastic tools to now begin to look for mechanistic association and how we can actually understand how each microbe engage unique population of cells. And the reason I think this is really an important line of research is because the macrobiota field has been an extremely intriguing and exploding uh, environment, but mechanistically, we remain a little bit low in terms of really to try to understand some of the dominant mechanism of control. So just to summarize some of the work uh, that we have done with one of these macrobes, for example. So here I'm showing you um, the data that we can obtain if you take Staphylococcus epidermidis. Staphylococcus epidermidis is a normal constituent of the skin microbe in human. All of us have Staphyl Staphyl can also, in some circumstances, become a pathogen. It has been shown, for example, very well in the context of um, uh, premature infant, for example. But in individuals in adults, this is really very much a part of the microbiota. Staphyl can colonize mice. And when you apply the microbe at the surface of the skin, you can see then, surprisingly, there is a CD8 response that is established. And those CD8 can go within the epidermis when they lodge themselves very much in the same place and tissues and memory cells induced against viruses. These cells can communicate with the epithelial cells where they enhance antimicrobial peptide production, thereby allowing the host to be better protected against subsequent infection. So this was demonstrating that adaptive response to a microbe, a skin microbe, can actually enhance the threshold activation of the tissue and protect against subsequent infection. What was really surprising is that in addition of promoting antimicrobial defenses, the same cells were actually allowing to promote tissue repair, which is of course a fundamental process of host survival. So uh, what a uh, few people in the laboratory was, were able to show is that soon after an injury, common cell specific T cells can actually lodge themselves at the periphery of the wound when they accelerate uh, this fundamental process of tissue repair. And we even have ongoing work in the laboratory highlighting that the same cells also play a fundamental role in the regeneration of sensory neuron um, um, dendrites. So these common cell specific T cells really are unusual. Not only they can enhance antimicrobial defenses, but they do that indirectly. This is not like a classical immune to pathogen, but they can also promote tissue repair uh, broadly, including not only epithelial cells remodeling, but also neuron uh, regeneration. So this actually led us to try to understand how the cells were able to do that. And I'm gonna just discuss a couple of the points that we uncover in the context of the specific interaction of safety. So what we're able to show, actually what John Linham was able to show um, before he joined the laboratory when he actually now studies on group at Genentech, what John was able to show is that is in terms of this associated immune system, the antigen that were seen by the immune system were unconventional antigen in the sense that they were unformulated peptide that are a canonical feature of bacteria. And in mice, those unformulated peptide are organized by the non-classical MSG molecule H2M3. So non-classical MSG molecules that are really highly conserved MSG molecules. So this was actually pointing to the idea that um, somehow in some system, non-classical immunity, that is really this ancient form of immunity that is utilizing those non-polymorphic MSG molecules, may represent the bridge between the immune system and the microbiota. So more recently uh, in the laboratory, Taylor and Sid have been continuing to explore uh, this unformulated peptide and were able to show that they're actually highly conserved, not only within the microbiota, but highly conserved across numerous pathogens. And ongoing collaboration with Federica Salusto really allow us now to generate a large number of clones in humans specific for this unformulated peptide. So we're now very much with Federica also exploring the importance of those highly conserved antigen. And also very, very intriguingly, we have evidence that in humans, um, actually E appear to be an important mediator of these responses. So it's actually quite intriguing to think that some of this immunity to the microbiota may not be mediated by the classical immunity we all think about, which is really specific fine resolution of antigen and actually highly polymorphic MHCs, but those highly conserved MHC molecules that are able to recognize highly conserved antigen. And this could actually somehow allow communication between those highly diverse microbes and the immune system. 
So this is actually what we continue to explore through numerous settings. The macrobiota is, of course, highly complex, contain an enormous amount of putative antigen. But among those antigen, there may be a simplification in this system by the overexpression of highly conserved determinants that can bind to highly conserved uh, receptors expressed by non-classical T cells. And this simplified language may really play a fundamental role in the ability of those highly diverse microbes to actually impose fundamental aspects of host physiology, including antimicrobial defenses and tissue repair. So of course, much more remains to be addressed. This is not the only form of communication of the microbiota with the immune system, but this really raised some really intriguing uh, potential in terms of therapy. And in particular, for example, we find the riboflavin derivative that actually the natural ligands for make cells can be utilized in the context of the wound healing just by applying them topically, and they can now recall those local responses and promote tissue repair. So maybe there is a way to utilize this understanding to recall those physiological responses when needed uh, in different settings. So I just wanted to briefly mention this intriguing phenomenon that we have actually observed in the context of this tissue repair, because why and how a cell that is able to promote antimicrobial defenses can at the same time promote tissue repair. And this was done by Oli Harris in the laboratory before he started his own group at the Nari Institute. And what Oli was able to find is that very surprisingly, when he looked at T cells generated against the macrobiota, he found that they were unusual in many different ways. They do express this molecule, araganati, that is extremely important to allow them to develop this R17 responses that is so important for antimicrobial defense. But at the same time, they express high level of another molecule that is called GALA3, that is usually highly expressed only on the class of immune cells that is called TH2 cells. So these appear to be a bit of a schizophrenic um, you know, phenomen phenotype in terms of T cell responses. But what Oli was able to show is having this co-expression of cells of, of transcription factor that is usually not seen in T cells generated pathogen allow the cells to have functional plasticity. And this can be summarized here. At steady state, common source specific T cells go to the tissue where they will produce R17. And this R17 communicates with the keratinocyte or the, 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 the epithelial cells of the gut and enhance antimicrobial peptide production, thereby protecting against infection. But those cells are really strangely wired in which they maintain the potential to express also a type 2 immunity, which is an immunity that has been shown to be important for tissue repair. And this now allow the cells in the context of tissue injury, and we have shown that in the context of a section, but also just with the bite of an insect. Just the bite of an insect on the skin can do that. This now allow those cells that are equipped with a receptor for IL-18 and all the other receptor to produce large amount of IL-13 in the tissue, now promoting tissue repair. So it's quite remarkable to think that common source specific T cells will be sitting in the tissues and can wait for different kind of stimuli to change their program and adapt in a very, very rapid way to the different environmental trigger. Of course, these cells have to be maintained under tight regulation. And Oli showed that if you decrease regulatory responses, common source specific T cells can now produce a large amount of type 2 cytokine and contribute to tissue damage. So one thing that we need to remember is that, uh, of course, uh, most of the antigens seen by the immune system are likely to be common source specific. And this will imply that the vast majority of T cells in tissue at steady states are common source specific. So really trying to understand how our cells are wired and how they can responses to inflammation, adjuvant, stimuli, and how this recall response from those cells can contribute to the response to various settings is actually gonna be very important to understanding a response to pathogen, but also response to vaccine. So I'm a little bit long, so I'm gonna maybe add a couple of point of some of the new data but very rapidly, just because I felt that it could be of interest to this group. Um, I'm just gonna show three slides about this uh, recent data. And this is actually something where we decided to explore how the macrobiota was able to induce the CD8 responses, because we really didn't have any reason, we didn't really understand the mechanism. So one thing that is extremely interesting about, if you apply uh, the macrobiota at the surface of the skin of a mice or primate, Something that we found that was really, really surprising when you look at the skin of keratinocyte is you don't have inflammation, because remember, it's a commensal. But what you have is an enormous antiviral response in the tissue. And that was really, really surprising. And at the beginning, we had no idea how to interpret this data. So you add the bacteria at the surface of the skin, and suddenly what you have is an antiviral program. 
This is actually not so surprising if you think about it, because other groups had actually shown that the macrobiota promote antiviral responses. And in fact, it was shown first by the group of David Avis and John Wery that having actually the macrobiota in the gut can enhance antiviral state in the lung. Of course, something of high relevance to infection. But this actually now uh, places us to try to understand how, why the macrobiota is able to induce uh, antiviral responses. And he started uh, to make us think about this really fundamental composition of our genome. Yes, we have an exogenous macrobiota, the one that is composed of bacteria, the one that is composed of phages and so forth. But 10% of our genome is composed of endogenous retroviruses, which is enormous. And these actually are vestigial remnant of retroviral infection that are part of our genome. So evolutionary, those elements have been deactivated, they have been actually controlled, but they maintain some transcriptional activity and some of them have been linked to biological function. So this actually led us to test the hypothesis that the macrobiota and endogenous retroviruses somehow may be able to communicate. So we tested this hypothesis by applying a staphyte at the surface of the skin and sure enough, what Sid was able to show is that staphyte induce endogenous retrovirus expression at the surface of the skin. So these um, endogenous retroviruses can, of course, in some cases, become nucleic acid. They could become double-stranded RNA, or they can become double-stranded DNA. And this will be in the context of reverse transcription that can actually be, remain active in, the, in the, some of those. So to see if endogenous retroviruses could be important for the response of macrobiota, we utilize a very simple approach, that is to use an antiretroviral that is utilized in the context of HIV treatment. And blocking this antiretroviral will block the ability of these endogenous retroviruses to generate DNA that could be potentially accessible for the innate immune system. Staphyp induces CD8 response in the skin, but you can see that if you block with an anti-RT, this is significantly decreased. So strangely enough, responding to the macrobiota is dependent on antiretroviral, on um, reverse transcriptive activity and potentially retrovirus expression in the tissue. Can be visualized here too. You can see the staphyp induced accumulation of numerous T cells in the skin within the epidermis. Treating the animal with antiretroviral block the ability of the mice to develop response to the common cell. So, because of the time, I'm just going to summarize my this finding because we don't have much time, which is the following. So, the model that we have found is that when a common cell communicates with the immune system, it communicates via TDRF TLR that can reactivate a uh, certain ERV. And it's really a very specific ERV. Those ERV can be reverse transcribed and they can now be sensed by the SIGA sting machinery. And these activate keratinocytes in a way that now initiate an immune responses. And this allows the development of what has been referring as this homeostatic quiescent physiological immunity. So I used to refer to the macrobiota as the endogenous adjuvant, but in fact, I was wrong. The real endogenous adjuvant are the endogenous retroviruses. So endogenous retroviruses expression in tissue is absolutely required to respond to the skin microbiota. And we have now evidence that this is not just the skin. We have similar data in the context of the lung and the GI tract. Importantly, SIGA sting expression that is actually allowing to organize DNA from this ER endogenous retro element is able to promote immune response to the microbiota. So really, we need to, to kind of rewire and rethink about host microbe interaction. That is really this multi-kingdom dialogue that not only include bacteria, but also those endogenous ancient partner virals and the mammalian immune system. And really this dialogue in those three elements is what allow the host to mount immune responses. So I think much more remain to be, to be done in so many directions. But the one thing that in the context of this specific class that I think would be really fascinating is how much actually this endogenous retroviral activity allow the host to develop immunity to, to pathogen, how much the baseline level of activation in tissue allow memory response to be generated, and how much adjuvant itself utilize those ERVs reactivation as a way to actually amplify local responses. I think there is an opportunity for us to just revisit this question at the broad level. And one thing that once again is fundamentally important is not only that bacteria is very different, macroid is very different, but ERV signature is extremely different between individuals. So I think, um, I think it would be really fascinating moving forward to really try to have a broader understanding of host physiology and integrate all those microbial components to understanding of immunity to pathogen and how to maybe utilizing those knowledge as a way to devise more physiological adjuvant approaches to vaccines. And on that, 
uh, have to thank all the people that have collaborated over the years. Um, I cited the work of few people in the laboratory, uh, um, the work, of course, of SEED uh, and many others. Many people have actually started their own groups since then. And I thank you all for your attention.